It has been called the Day of Days. It is a time of magic, pageantry, warmth, generosity and love. For many of us, our fondest childhood memories revolve around the traditions of Christmas. It is a time that many around the world celebrate as the birth of Jesus Christ, the Savior and Messiah of mankind. In recent years, however, the spiritual holiday has become a time of mass marketing and crass commercialism. Incredibly, many businesses derive more than half their yearly income during this period. The process of gift giving, once thought to have come from the story of the wise men who offered gifts to the newborn Christ, has evolved into the buying frenzy we see today during the month of December. But what about the other Christmas traditions? Have you ever wondered why we decorate the Christmas tree? Why we light the Yule log? Why we hang the mistletoe? And why we teach our children to believe in Santa Claus? In the next hour, you will discover the true origins of Christmas. You may be surprised or even shocked to learn the source of your favorite holiday traditions. Chances are, you'll never look at Christmas the same ever again. Hemisphere during late December, the days are at their shortest lengths and the nights are at their longest. For those of the pagan world, this has always been the greatest time of the year to celebrate and practice the works of darkness. The pagan calendar identifies this period as the winter solstice. It was during the pre Christian midwinter pagan celebrations of Scandinavia's Norsemen where today's Christmas traditions began. As a means of honoring the pagan sex and fertility god Yule, a 12-day celebration during the month of December was inaugurated. A large single log considered to be a phallic idol was lit on fire and kept burning for 12 days. Animal or human sacrifices were offered in the fire on each of those days. Wild, delirious reveling accompanied the daily sacrifices as drunken participants defiantly strove to make contact with spirits. A thousand miles away in pre-Christian Rome, celebrants were paying homage to their own gods during the winter solstice. Witchcraft traditions hold that a number of pagan gods were given birth during this period, including Dionysus, Attis, and Baal, chief male god of fertility and licentiousness. Another pagan god from Persia, identified as Mithra, was said to have been born specifically on December 25th. Mithra was the god of the unconquerable sun, the god of the light between heaven and earth, worshipped at that time by an influential Roman cult. His birth symbolized an end to the long nights and a return to the dominance of the sun. During the month-long winter solstice celebration, courts in Rome were closed. Any and all crimes were allowed. Homosexuality, cross-dressing, and uncontrolled debauchery reigned supreme. Rome's order was turned upside down. Even children were allowed to join in the drunken orgies as part of the juvenilia celebration. By 270 AD, the Roman Emperor Aurelian had made it official, setting aside a seven-day period from December the 17th through the 24th, culminating in an exchange of gifts on December the 25th to celebrate the birth of the Sun God. This Roman orgy to end all orgies later became known as Saturnalia in honor of the god Saturn, the god of excess. Roman soldiers invading Britain brought with them their pagan orgiistic traditions. Upon taking root in England, Saturnalia became known as the festival of fools reigned over by the Lord of Misrule. By the fourth century, the influential government-sanctioned Church of Rome, unable to outlaw the growing number of pagan practices, chose instead to adopt them into their so-called official Christianity. The Church believed this would attract more pagans to their fold. Up until this time, the birthday of Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah, had not been celebrated at all. Ignoring scriptures, however, indicating that the birth probably did not occur during the winter, 
the church nevertheless confused biblical history and made Jesus' birthday coincide with the pagan god Mithra. The birth date of the sun god had now become the birth date of the son of God. It was hoped that the pagan celebrations of Saturnalia would merge into this new legally sanctioned form of Christianity. The church's practice of changing the dates of Christian events to coincide with pagan festivals continued, and by the 7th century, Pope Gregory I had ordered Augustine of Canterbury to incorporate any and all pagan practices and customs into the expanding Roman Catholic Church. During the Middle Ages, the debased Mardi Gras atmosphere of what was now known as Christ's Mass had reached a fevered pitch. Common practices included open sex in the streets, rioting, murder, and a number of pagan druidic Halloween rituals. This blood-drenched celebration got so out of hand that by 1652, following the execution of King Charles I, Christ's Mass was finally outlawed in England. A religious reform movement began sweeping the country led by Puritan Oliver Cromwell. The Puritans took the biblical mandate seriously which commanded that Christianity remain pure and separate from paganism. Despite their noble efforts, the celebration simply went underground and by 1656, after only four short years under the ban, the public's demand for the legalization of Christ's Mass had become insurmountable. The appointment of Charles II to the throne restored England's monarchy and with it the celebration of Christ's Mass. The Puritans had lost England, but they held high hopes for the new world. When the first settlers came from England, uh, they were, for the most part, Puritans. They came here for religious freedom. They came here to be free to worship God without a hierarchy and without the corruption of the organized church that they had known before. And uh, when they came, they came with the clear knowledge of the danger of these pagan practices that had become so dear to the hearts of uh, their ancestors. Following England's lead in 1659, the colonies of America had likewise outlawed Christmas. For 200 years, the clergy in New England battled to keep the riotous celebrations honoring the pagan god Saturn from infiltrating the New World. The Reverend Cotton Mather had warned in a Christmas Day sermon in 1712, Can you in your conscience think that your Holy Savior is honored by hard drinking, lewd reveling, and by a mass fit for none but Borcus or Saturn? But the public's taste for sin and revelry persisted. In 1828, gang rioting during the Saturnalia-like Christmas celebrations got so bad that cities such as New York were forced to institute a professional police force for the first time in order to control the savagery. Christmas was not only not widely celebrated, in many cases, uh, many places, Christmas celebrations were actually outlawed. And this was because of uh, the attitude of many of the churches who regarded it as primarily as a pagan celebration and as a reproach to the Lord. By the mid-19th century, American churches were the last remaining holdout in the war against the validation of Christmas. However, they too finally succumbed as a result of the efforts of the American Sunday School Society, who began advocating Christmas programs for children as a method of filling the pews. The society argued that children could be taught about the birth of Christ through the reenactment of the nativity. They also offered candy and treats to the children as a means of enticing families into accepting the holiday despite its notorious history and blatantly pagan roots. The successful technique of bribing children with candy would later be used on an unsuspecting American populace in the effort to promote the acceptance of the pagan rituals of Halloween. However, it was the work of England's most popular writer, Charles Dickens, whose ghostly 1843 book, A Christmas Carol, cemented the Christmas holiday in the hearts of Americans forever. Dickens' well-loved story made the pagan Christmas feasts, shining trees, glittering shops, and family warmth irresistible to those wanting to experience the holiday.
Coming to America in 1867 to promote his work, Charles Dickens packed theaters as he read his story to cheering audiences around the country. A Christmas Carol gripped America and destroyed any final attempt to stop the evolution of Christmas. By 1875, the Puritans had been beaten, and by 1890, all American states had voted to make Christmas a legal holiday. Today's tradition of the Christmas Yule Log stems directly from the worship of the pre-Christian Scandinavian fertility god Yule. The burning of this phallic idol is also responsible for the concept of the 12 days of Christmas, which represented the 12 daily sacrifices offered up in the Yule Log's flames. Another uh, good example of the um, pagan elements of Christmas is the whole concept of Yule and the Yule Log. The, uh, the very term is derived from uh, uh, the Norse god Yule, spelled J-U-L. And uh, uh, every year around Christmas time, uh, a huge log was uh, uh, cut down and uh, fashioned into a uh, fertility symbol and then burned uh, for 12 days. And on each successive day, a, a, a new sacrifice to the god Yule was performed uh, uh, in the fire, and a new sacrificial victim was, uh, was burned to death. Uh, sometimes, but not always, these sacrificial victims were uh, human beings. And the whole uh, notion of the 12 days of Christmas also comes to us from this uh, Norse pagan tradition. In an attempt to blur the origins of this horrific ritual, the Church of Rome placed the first day of the Mass of Christ on December 25th and the 12th day on January the 6th. Despite no scriptural references for January the 6th, it was selected as the day the wise men supposedly arrived to offer gifts to the newborn Christ. This day then has become known as Epiphany. During the Dark Ages, the European custom of putting an oil-lighted wick lamp in the windows during the 12 days of Christmas signified to neighbors that the occupants were participating in the pagan worship of the phallic idol Yule. In today's commercialism, this is where we get the tradition of decorating our houses with Christmas lights. The Yule log custom was originally brought over to America by Scandinavian immigrants during the 1600s. And despite attempts to ban the tradition, it has stayed with us to this very day. Today, when we wish someone Yuletide greetings, we are in a sense invoking the power of the fertility god Yule upon that person. During the Saturnalia celebrations, holly and other greens were hung over doorways as part of a pagan ritual to ward off evil. To deck the halls with boughs of holly was to acknowledge the powers of the nature gods. According to Wiccan rituals, placing holly or other greens in the shape of a circle or wreath accentuated its magical power. Similarly, mistletoe, when used in the casting of Wiccan or Druidic spells, could render a woman helpless and open to sexual exploitation. This is where we get our custom of hanging mistletoe in doorways today and if a woman is caught underneath, she may be kissed and must not resist. The fir tree, uh, the mistletoe, uh, all of these things uh, typically uh, are come from uh, uh, overtly uh, pagan traditions, uh, in, typically in, from Northern Europe, German, Norse, and uh, English. Likewise, evergreen trees have always represented sex and fertility in pagan cultures. During the winter solstice, trees would be chopped down, brought inside, set up, and decorated as idols for worship. The Christmas tree was regarded uh, as, a, as a sacred tree. Uh, the, uh, the pagans of northern Europe uh, t typically uh, worshipped trees. They uh, regarded trees uh, and groves as sacred. So uh, uh, the bringing of the uh, tree into the house would be a way of uh, bringing this uh, supernatural uh, source of blessing uh, into your home. That was, that was the whole idea that there were, there were spirits uh, who resided in the trees. In the Middle Ages, the tradition of the winter solstice Christmas tree primarily took root in Germany. 
During his reign, King George I, himself of German extraction, brought the custom to Victorian England. German immigrants settling in Pennsylvania did the same in America during the early 1800s. In 1848, the London Illustrated News published this famous engraving depicting Queen Victoria and her royal family beside a decorated Christmas tree. And within a few years, nearly every English household had their own tree in allegiance to the monarchy. By 1900, the U.S. Forest Service estimated that at least one in five homes in America had adopted the Christmas tree tradition. Thousands of years earlier, God, speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, warned against this pagan practice in the Old Testament. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the ways of the heathen, for the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, they deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers that it move not. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. Santa Claus is another uh, good example of a pagan element of, of Christmas. Santa Claus, as we know him today, is a, uh, an amalgamation of several different traditions. But uh, in most cultures throughout the world, uh, you will find the existence of what is known as hearth gods, uh, gods who uh, guard uh, the hearth and the chimney and keep the fires burning and make sure the food cooks properly and the people are warm and what have you. And at a certain time of year, uh, in the middle of winter, typically, uh, the hearth god dressed in red will come down the chimney to reward those who uh, have pleased him during the course of the previous year and to uh, lay uh, curses or hexes or other forms of uh, uh, punishment upon uh, people who have displeased him. The concept of Santa Claus has had a long and winding history with a number of diverse cultures contributing to the composite character we have today. Beginning once again in Scandinavia, Santa's original incarnation was in the form of Odin, the pagan god of thunder. A tall fellow with a long flowing beard who inhabited the spirit-infested Nordic forests. Odin would travel the sky during the winter solstice deciding who would die and who would prosper. Most believers were frightened of this particular time of year. In England, Odin eventually evolved into Father Christmas, who, crowned with sprigs of holly, traveled the countryside getting roaring drunk as part of the Festival of Fools celebration. Frequently he would be accompanied by a horned goat, ironically the biblical symbol of those who reject the salvation of Jesus Christ. According to the traditions of the Church of Rome, there was a Turkish bishop named Nicholas who hailed from Myra in Asia Minor during the fourth century. He was known as the patron saint of seafaring men. Over the centuries, as the legend began to unfold, it was rumored that St. Nicholas had actually captured the devil himself, put him in chains, and made him his personal servant. Recognized in various cultures as Krampus, Beelzebub, or Zwart Pete, Black Peter, this assistant of St. Nicholas is best known by his German name, Necht Ruprecht. Described as a hideous horned creature, the servant Ruprecht was a dark and sinister figure who stood in stark contrast to the saintly Nicholas. Somehow, Father Christmas's companion, the horned goat, had metamorphosized into the foreboding horned devil called Ruprecht. As St. Nicholas traveled from house to house, inquiring about the behavior of children, Ruprecht would drop candy and gifts down the chimney into the good children's shoes which had been placed there. It was from this story that we get our tradition of hanging stockings on the mantle at Christmas time. If able to recite a verse or demonstrate a skill for St. Nicholas, the child would receive a gift. If unable to remember a verse or if the child had been bad, he or she would receive a switch or a whip. Ruprecht also carried a large sack which he would frequently use to haul away the really bad boys and girls. As more and more Christian churches began combining the pagan rituals of the winter solstice with the celebration of the birth of Christ, emphasis on St. Nicholas's role began to shift. 
Some cultures began to downplay the role of St. Nicholas, but surprisingly retained Ruprecht. Eventually, Necht Ruprecht was made the companion and servant to the Christ child himself. In this scenario, the devil is actually given the title Venoxman or Santa Claus. 19th century writer Theodore Storm, in his story about Necht Ruprecht, even goes so far as to describe the switches given to the children by Ruprecht as tools to be used in sadomasochistic rituals. Soon, the image of Ruprecht would fade from the Christmas tradition, but not his sadistic influence. Many of the early depictions of Santa Claus portrayed him not as a jolly gift giver, but of an unfriendly disciplinarian complete with a ready switch or whip. One of the problems with the Christmas gift thing for children is that it really is a religious teaching, a wrong religious teaching, because it teaches them that if they're nice, they get the gifts. If they're naughty, they don't. Or in my case, I was taught that he would leave us a bundle of switches. Uh, isn't that interesting? Uh, it's a salvation by uh, my own personal virtue. But, but there's a second thing wrong with it, and that is that they're going to get those gifts whether they're naughty or nice, because most parents love their children and, and won't, wouldn't dream of, quote, ruining their Christmas, and they're not going to ruin Christmas, they're going to give those children the gifts anyway, and some, sooner or later those thinking children are going to realize, I wasn't very nice, but I got the gift anyway. So it isn't important to be nice, it isn't important to do what is right and avoid what is wrong. German immigrants coming to America during the 1620s tried to influence the New World with the stories of St. Nicholas and his gift-giving companion, Necht Ruprecht. But somehow the idea just didn't take hold until almost 200 years later. In 1819, America's best-selling author, Washington Irving, used his influence to promote St. Nicholas in a popular Christmas story titled Brace Bridge Hall. Consulting Irving's writings, Episcopalian minister Clement Clark Moore penned a decidedly secular tale called A Visit from St. Nicholas in 1822. Later retitled The Night Before Christmas, Moore's poem was based on the tales of German and Dutch immigrants who had come to America. Intended originally only for his own children, Moore's story was published in the Troy Sentinel in New York and became an overnight sensation. Gone were the bishop's remnant of St. Nicholas. He was now a jolly old elf imbued with supernatural powers. Moore had also replaced Nicholas's companion, the horned necked Ruprecht, with eight horned magical reindeer. As the popularity of the night before Christmas grew, Moore became increasingly concerned that the story's emphasis on the supernatural and its disregard for Christ would reflect poorly on his position as a minister. As a result, he refused to take credit for its creation until the story became so popular that he could no longer resist. Forty years later, illustrator Thomas Nast, political cartoonist for Harper's Weekly, seared the image of Santa Claus into the minds of the world by creating a drawing which combined Moore's jolly old elf with images of St. Nicholas taken from his own native Bavaria. By 1880, Santa was a thoroughly secularized folk hero who had become increasingly irresistible to retailers worldwide. One factor that has contributed to uh, the paganization of Christmas, the complete paganization of Christmas, has been the element of commercialism. Uh, it may seem odd to think of it in that context, but uh, remember that Christ himself identified the love of money as a spiritual force in and of itself. And where it comes into play, it has a kind of naturally hostile effect on, uh, on the gospel and the, uh, uh, the Christian faith. So the commercialization of Christmas has helped to h highlight the pagan elements and to uh, drive the overtly Christian elements further underground. To me, the most obscene thing about Christmas celebrations and customs as we know them is that as a result of these things, Jesus is displaced in the hearts of children by Santa Claus. The love, affection, appreciation, trust, the, the desire to emulate these things that they should have in their hearts and minds as growing children for Jesus himself, to whom they owe everything. Uh, instead, this has been stolen. This has been 
uh, raped out of their hearts in a sense and displaced by the myth of Santa Claus. He takes the place of God or of Jesus Christ in the special world that is Christmas. Uh, he has supernatural knowledge of, uh, of your history. He has supernatural knowledge of, uh, of your present, of your attitudes. He's keeping a list. He knows who's naughty and nice. Your parents don't even know that. Uh, he's obviously got some, uh, some conduit to knowledge that is uh, beyond the human. Uh, and he, uh, he flies through the air, uh, he, he was capable of visiting every place on the globe in the course of a single night. In many, many ways, Santa exhibits supernatural qualities that uh, provide a kind of a surrogate deity or a substitute for, uh, for God or for Christ. Myths, by definition, evolve and change and things are added. Uh, we, we used to have a Santa Claus figure uh, that was confused with Saint Nicholas and confused with other pagan figures and then somehow he evolved through the drawings of Thomas Nast and others into what we see today but he had a sleigh with eight supernatural reindeer that can fly. And so the, the Christmas traditions that are pagan continue to change. But the truth of Jesus, the truth of the Incarnation, the truth that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, never changes, never will. Various scriptures in the Bible, including the second chapter of Luke, record the events surrounding the birth of the Messiah. A decree from Caesar Augustus had gone out requiring all people to return to the city of their origin for taxation purposes. Mary, who was pregnant with a child conceived by the Holy Spirit, made the difficult journey to Bethlehem along with her husband Joseph. Both Joseph and Mary were of the lineage of King David. Upon arrival, they found all the inns to be full, but were provided with a stable where Mary could have her baby. At the same time, an angel announcing the birth of the Messiah appeared to shepherds tending their flocks in a field nearby. The stunned shepherds hurried to Bethlehem and found the baby Jesus lying in a manger just as the angel had declared. Although traditional nativity scenes placed three wise men at the stable at the time of Jesus Christ's birth, according to scripture, these wise men visited Jesus later at his home. Because three gifts are named, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, tradition says three men gave them. But exactly how many wise men visited Jesus is not known. The birth of Jesus Christ miraculously fulfilled a number of Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah, including that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would be born of a virgin, and that he would be a descendant of King David's. The, the concept or the idea of celebrating the birth of Jesus once a year had apparently never occurred to the church fathers. In the first three centuries of the church's history, there was no such thing. And I think God perhaps very carefully avoided telling us in the scriptures when he was born. We can be sure of one thing, it wasn't in late December, and uh, because in the first place shepherds don't abide by their flocks in the fields by night in late December, it's too cold. They take them out in the morning to pasture, uh, uh, protect them while they eat all day, and then bring them back in at night. So it wasn't in late December. For some, Christmas today simply means a time to get together as a family. For pagans, it is a deeply religious time to celebrate the winter solstice. Retailers, of course, view it with eyes towards making huge profits. Others use this time to reflect on the birth or conception of Jesus Christ while many parents use Christmas to perpetuate the myth of Santa Claus to their children. In order to carry on this myth of Santa Claus, we must lie to our children. We must deceive them. We literally must lie to our children. And one of the wonderful things about children is that they naturally believe everything that we tell them when they're small. They trust us to tell them the truth. And if we deceive them in this way, it has to be destructive because at some point in their future lives they're going to wonder if other things we told them were true. The things we told them about the Lord, were they really true? It plants the seeds of doubt and anyway it creates disappointment, it creates disillusionment. To my mind the question is not so much whether to celebrate Christmas or even how to celebrate Christmas 
but to be able to make any decision knowledgeably. Whether you celebrate it or you don't celebrate it, you should know why you're doing so. You should understand what the pagan roots of Christmas are, and with that knowledge, you can discount them or ignore them if you choose to do so. It is not the purpose of this film to tell you which Christmas rituals should and should not be practiced by you and your family. This is between you and the Lord. What Christians should be most concerned about, however, are the growing pagan influences infiltrating every area of our rapidly degenerating society. Recently, we took our cameras to the Nevada desert where we witnessed 35,000 pagans from around the country participating in a week-long celebration of sex, drugs, and hedonism. Here, everything was permissible and encouraged, except for the adoration of Jesus Christ. In nearly every ritual performed, Christianity was mercilessly mocked and despised. Each year, the numbers of participants continues to grow. Its attraction is expanding worldwide as it recruits through the Internet. It is sobering to witness what could be the wave of the future unfolding before our eyes. It is not only permitted uh, in the public schools, in the government schools, to celebrate holidays. It is encouraged and in some uh, instances required. But with this, uh, with this uh, uh, condition, they must be pagan. They must not be Christian. And Christmas time, they are, they are certainly encouraged to put on Christmas programs and Christmas plays. Uh, but all references to Jesus, all references to the gospel, all references to the incarnation, all references to God must be omitted. They sing about Santa Claus, they sing about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and God only knows what else they sing about that isn't scriptural. Since the pagan elements in Christmas are so strong, and they provide virtually the, the entirety of the structure and the content of the holiday, there is no Christian element in the holiday, therefore it becomes the ideal uh, politically correct, culturally diverse, uh, multicultural holiday uh, for, for, everyone, for, for everyone. In the 17th chapter of John, Jesus taught that it was appropriate for his followers to be in the world, but not of the world, meaning that we should be involved in our world so as to have a positive influence, but not become corrupted by it. The mighty Joshua, in challenging his people, said, Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the other gods which your fathers served. Choose you this day whom ye will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Rather than setting aside a few days of the year to remember the Lord, Christians should live with a day-by-day, moment-by-moment dedication of their entire lives to Jesus Christ. Then, and only then, will they be able to have victory over pagan influences and to have an impact on society for God the Creator. To those with a heart for evangelism, Christmas time provides a wonderful opportunity to tell others about the true gospel, about God's plan of redemption, and the real purpose for Jesus Christ entering the world. <laughs>